the Tiananmen Square massacre benefited the modern people of China in the long run because the courageous actions of the protesters showed the government how unjust and unfair the rule was, causing positive and negative reforms in China. Before the revolution, China was in very bad shape. The government became very commanding and the people did not have many rights. Also, there was high levels of corruption in high-ranking government officials and that began to show in the economy. The people had absolutely no freedom of the press or freedom of the media. It was hard for them to communicate and publish public documents. The entire country of China was doing very poorly, and it got even worse when the iconic leader of reform, Hu Yaobang, suffered a fatal heart attack on April 15, 1989. The revolution did not start as a revolution, but as a mourning of Hu Yaobang's death. This event gave the students from Peking University and Tsinghua University a chance to gather in large numbers and make posters, all praising Hu's courageous efforts to promote democracy and a socialist free market economy. The students were calling for a reversal of Hu's legacy. However, within a few days, the mass gatherings of students started focusing on bigger political issues than Hu's death. They focused much more on freedom of the press, democracy, and corruption in the government. Then on the night of April 17th, Peking University and Tsinghua University students marched into Tiananmen Square and started protesting by drafting seven pleas and suggestions for the government. Later known as the Seven Demands, these demands for the government were 1. Affirm as correct Hu Yaobang's views on democracy and freedom. 2. Admit that the campaigns against spiritual pollution and bourgeois liberalization had been wrong. 3. Publish information on the income of state leaders and their family members. 4. End the ban on privately run newspapers and stop press censorship. 5. Increase funding for education and raise intellectuals' pay. 6. End restrictions on demonstrations in Beijing. 7. Provide objective coverage of students in official media. Then the next morning on April 18th, the police intervened and persuaded many of the students to leave. However, there were many reports of police brutality and these accounts quickly spread throughout the universities, which led to many more student protesters. Soon the protests got too wild and Zhao Ziyang, the general secretary of the Communist Party, was forced to call a meeting of the Proliferal Standing Committee, PSC. Zhao stressed three points, discourage students from further protests and ask them to go back to class, use all measures necessary to combat rioting, and open forms of dialogue with students at different levels of government. Then he left to go on a state trip to North Korea and left Li Peng in charge. Li then organized a large meeting with many of the high-ranking officials, such as President Yang Chang Kun, to discuss how to approach these student protests. They decided on a plan that would attempt to scare the students by threatening them. So on April 26, the party's official newspaper, People's Daily, issued a front-page editorial targeted towards the protesters. It accused extremely small segments of opportunists of plotting to overthrow the Communist Party and the political system. However, instead of scaring the students into submission, the statement enraged students because they interpreted it as a direct indictment on the protests and its cause. Therefore, it antagonized the students against the state. The editorial proved to be a major turning point for the remainder of the protests. Soon, hundreds of thousands of people joined the protest and marched into Tiananmen Square. The protest was gathering momentum, and it wasn't until May 20th that the government declared martial law. So on May 20th, the People's Liberation Army attempted to penetrate the city, but found that they were blocked off at the suburbs by mass gatherings of protesters. The students were seen surrounding the tanks and trying to persuade the soldiers to join their cause. On June 2nd, the newspapers and magazines published more articles from the Chinese government telling the students to leave and to stop protesting. However, this just acted as fuel for the student protesters and made them more hungry for reform. Then finally, on June 4th, the 27th and 38th armies of the People's Liberation Army were sent in to clear the square of protests. The protesters soon found out about this and went hurriedly to stop the tanks from entering, as they had done two weeks earlier. The protesters threw stones and many other things at the soldiers, but the soldiers opened fire and killed many protesters and many innocent civilians. They entered the square by force and then blocked the exits out of the square and killed any protester that tried to leave. They stayed there all night long and killed thousands and thousands of people. Then in the morning on June 5th, protesters, parents of the protesters, and workers tried to enter the square but were shot and killed. The amount of dead protesters is staggering. The exact number is unknown, but the Chinese Red Cross estimated a casualty figure of about 2,600. The reaction from people within China was shock and anger. On June 5th and June 6th, many people from Shanghai and Xi'an marched onto the streets and stopped traffic with roadblocks. Thousands of people were late to work, and there was absolute chaos everywhere. The mayors had to make speeches about damage to the city and how to restabilize the province. Many people blocked entrances to factories, so many people could not work. Also, they encouraged many workers to go on strike. Many of the people in major cities and provinces across China panicked and started withdrawing large amounts of cash and panic buying. Also, all across China, many university students were taking a stand to the podium and making speeches across the country to try and persuade more protesters.
However, the tenseness and the chaos died down fairly quickly, and on June 9th, most of the revolution had died. The reaction from the government was a little bit different, however, and on June 9th, the leader, Deng Xiaoping, appeared in public for the first time since the protests began. He first started the meeting by showing respect for the PLA soldiers who had died, but not the dead protesters. Then Deng described his opinion of the revolution. He believed that the entire goal of the movement was to overthrow the Communist Party and the state. He stated that the protesters' goal was to establish a completely Western independent republic. Deng later argued that protesters had only used corruption as a cover for their real motive, which was to replace the socialist system with something new, something imperialistic. He then claimed that the Western world wants to convert all socialist countries into capitalist states, and then take control of them. The international reaction was also very bizarre, because the events at Tiananmen Square were the first of their type shown in detail on Western television. The Chinese government's response was denounced, particularly by Western governments and media. Criticism came from both Western and Eastern Europe, North America, Australia, and some East Asian and Latin American countries. Notably, many Asian countries remained silent throughout the protests. The government of India responded to the massacre by ordering the state television to pare down the coverage to the barest minimum, so as not to jeopardize the thawing in relations with China, and to offer political empathy for the events. North Korea, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany, among others, supported the Chinese government and denounced the protests. Overseas, Chinese students demonstrated in many cities in Europe, America, the Middle East, and Asia. Right after the massacre, the government strongly restricted China's press freedom. For example, two news anchors from Xinhua and Lianbo broadcasted this event and were later fired because they displayed sad emotions toward protesters. However, nowadays Chinese people have evolved and can now roam the web freely and publish whatever they want to the public. The Tiananmen Square protests led to a strengthened role for the state. One of the revolution's effects is that many of the freedoms introduced during the 1980s were withdrawn as the country returned to a conventional Leninist mold and re-established firm control over the press, publishing, and mass media. The government took full control of everything and the people ended up with even less rights than before. Also, before the revolution, China had a separation of powers government to prevent another Maoist total control regime. However, after the protests, the positions of President, General Secretary, and Central Military Commission Chairman were all combined into one position. In modern day China, this totalitarian position is held by Hu Jintao. Also, in 1989, neither the Chinese military nor the Beijing police had sufficient anti riot gear, such as rubber bullets or tear gas, to suppress the protests, and instead they used weapons of destruction, such as tanks and deadly rifles. After the Tiananmen Square protests, however, riot police in Chinese cities were equipped with non lethal equipment for riot control. The protests led to increased spending on internal security and expanded the role of the People's Armed Police in suppressing urban protests. Also, after the protests, there was a resurgence of conservative attitudes towards reform among policymakers. Their goal was to slow the rapid changes that were said to have been one of the causes to the protest. Deng Xiaoping, who was known as the architect of the reform policy, saw his influence reduce significantly after the revolution. This forced him to make concessions with socialist hardliners, and when Zhao Ziyang lost power after the protests, Deng lost his most valuable asset in completing his economic vision, because Zhao Ziyang shared Deng's vision for economic reform. Facing pressure from the conservative camp, Deng decided it would be best to create space between him and the affairs of the state. However, the pace of reform soon became way too slow and it frustrated many provincial governors so that by the early 1990s, economic reform broke down completely. Then on Deng's sudden tour of 1992, where he aimed to reinstate his economic reform policy, Deng criticized the leftist hardliners that had gained power following the protests and praised entrepreneurship and other market-driven policies. Initially ignored by Beijing, the Chinese Politburo eventually sided with Deng and economic reform again gained prominence. Nowadays, China is a global superpower because of the increased levels of entrepreneurship and the new free market economy. They are the world's leading exporter. After the protests, foreign loans to China were suspended by the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and foreign governments. Also, tourism revenue from the U.S. decreased by $4 billion. Foreign direct investment commitments were canceled, and there was a rise in defense spending from 8.6% in 1986 to 15.5% in 1990, reversing a previous 10-year decline. Finally, on January 31st in 1992, Chinese Premier Li Peng visited the United Nations Security Council and argued that the economic and arms embargo on China were a violation of national sovereignty. China experienced nearly three years of economic sanctions and scorn from the international community after the massacre, yet the Chinese government continued its hardline policies toward all civilian dissent. On subsequent anniversaries of the military attack, Beijing has maintained an official position of denial and repression. A heavy police presence stifles the city every year around June 4th, and international news broadcasts commemorating the event are interrupted and blocked. Hotels have all been instructed to unplug their satellite connections to CNN. However, 20 years later, China is very different. 
They are now a very successful country, and they have a new free market economy, which has made them one of the wealthiest countries in the world and the fastest growing economy on the planet. Their image is recovering from that very violent crackdown on June 4th, 1989. Nowadays, China is not nearly viewed as bad as before, and although they are still ruled by the Communist Republic of China, they are a single republic capitalist country. They have evolved, and nowadays their governing policies and economy is much more resembling of a capitalist country. However, the biggest thing of all is that the Chinese people now have much more freedom than before. They have much more freedom of the press, and nowadays they are allowed to publish freely to the public. Although they do have some censorships on CNN and the internet, other than that, the people can freely roam the web. The people in China are overall much happier, and the treatment of the people is much better. China is a new country.